I get a lot of questions from people who are interested in doing solo RPG about what rule set they can use where they just need to buy one book. And we know that uh, the RPG world is full of rule sets where you can buy tons of books and tons of material and supplements, but a lot of people starting out, understandably, are interested in just starting out to try to use a rule set that just has one book. So what I'm going to do here in this video is we're going to talk about three different rule sets that I have that are one book and the pluses and minuses for attempting to use them as solo play. None of these are solo designed, but they are all solo able. And I'm going to go through the three of them. This one was published in 2011, 2017, and 2021. And just talk about what they offer, the pluses and minuses of using them. These are not the only three, or maybe even they're not the best three. They just happen to be three rule books that I have that everything is contained in one book and which I think are possible to use solo. We're going to start by looking at 3D6 in order. This is by Richard Tung, and the credits here are here. And you'll note that it is based on Swords and Wizardry White Box, which is also the basis for the white box rule set that I'll show. That's really coincidental. The, the basis for the rules doesn't have anything to do with my selection of the two. These just happen to be really the ones that I grabbed off my shelf first and because I had used them myself. Looking at the table of contents here, it is pretty standard fare. We have a getting started chapter, which will talk about some of the basic rules. Character classes, should be familiar, cleric, druid, fighter, paladin, ranger, thief, assassin, magic user, illusionist, healer, and pyrocaster. Races, dwarf, elf, halfling, gnome, half elf, half orc, and half ogre. Items and equipment. We have some rules about playing the game, spells and magic, running the game, and designing an adventure. We'll take a look at that. And then we have the, the monster section, and this is key to really all of these books that they do contain monster sections, obviously, to provide you with everything you need to run and play a game out of one book. There's a section here, a, a nice section here on treasures, and then some GM notes that include options for creating new spells and other races and even new monsters and adapting some random monsters. So let's take a quick look here at the forward to understand how this game came to be. And the writer says it began as a joke. No kidding. No, he's quite serious. His, his original book, our idea, was to present, present a set of house rules for Swords and Wizardry White block, Box that his group could use. And as he began to do that, he realized that he was putting together his own game and that he felt this addresses a lot of the problems that D&D &D had in the past. And the result was this game. It says here, the goal was always to produce a game that was complete in a single book. And by and large, I think I have succeeded. He wasn't interested in having a game line with lots of supplements, etc. He wanted to make sure this was compatible with the original Dungeons and Dragons and that no conversion work should be necessary. And the goal behind the game is to provide readers with or players with options and choices. So he added in some more races and classes, but wanted to preserve the spirit of OD and D as he saw it. And um, it does say here that he puts his own spin on things, and unlike many games in the OSR, he's made no attempt to mimic a specific edition. So that is a little of the gaming philosophy behind this rule set. And let's just quickly look over the rules themselves. And as you would imagine from the name of this game, we are rolling 3d6 in order for our attributes of strength, intelligence, wisdom, constitution, dexterity, and charisma. There is alignment in this game. And there are the mentioned classes. And we get class abilities here. And each class has an advancement table that will explain to you 
not only what experience you need, but give a new name to the level of cleric. For example, a third level cleric becomes a priest or a fifth level becomes a prefect. I like that little touch because it adds um, it adds a bit of uh, narrative flavor and it makes it um, a more appealing than just a level four druid. Instead, you're going to be an initiate of the third rank. A level three fighter is a swordsman and a level four fighter is a hero. And then you have a swashbuckler if you get to level five. For the magic users, you have your expected list of spells by level and there are, there's a suggestion here about what first level magic users should have and an indication that you can roll randomly on the spell table to decide what spells they get after the basic ones. Then we come to the races, the dwarf, the elf, the halfling, and the other races, and everybody is going to get a description and some specific race abilities. We'll take a look here at one of my favorite races, the gnome related to dwarves, sharing many of their idiosyncrasies, but having an appreciation for the magical world that sometimes seems more akin to the elves. They have a wistful way about them and live either clustered in small communities of their own in the hills or close to other humanoids. They can advance to fifth level as fighters and their affinity for illusion magic allows them to reach seventh level if they are going to be an illusionist. And it gives some restrictions here for weapons and armor and some specifics about fighting giants. Giants, ogres, and similar giant type creatures such as trolls are not good at fighting gnomes and only inflict half the normal damage against them. So every uh, one of these races is going to have some specificity about it. And then we come to items and equipment with what you would expect, a damage, a weight, a cost, any type of notes, for example, the battle axe is two-handed, etc. This is all very familiar and and then under the playing the game section we get some indication here once the characters have been created the GM will describe where the characters are and what they can see the game might start in a rural peasant village a vast and teeming city a tavern etc there are not rules or tables or descriptions for that in this book and indeed at least to this and white box doesn't have that i can't remember about the um, eyes behind the torchlight we'll take a look at that when we get there this is part of what you will be losing when you are focusing on one book or what you could be losing because you're not going to have in many cases that type of environmental build or setting and you'll have to come up with that on your own it's going to be most likely just the bare bone rules. There's a nice gameplay example here that um, gives some sense of how the mechanics work with the narrative development of the play. And then we get into spells and magic with the mentioned uh, level spells here. There's also a note on how you can create your own spells. And that's pretty useful, I think, because by definition, it's going to be fairly limited in terms of what is presented here. There's only one column, for example, of first level spells, but you could follow this instruction and create some relevant other spells for various levels and various types of magic users. The chapter on running the game reminds us that the whole point of 3D6 in order is a simple rule system that allows substantial player choice that um, you should not be buried under paperwork as a GM in between games. So it's talking about how to design a campaign setting and asking some questions. Are, you, are there scenarios you wanna use? It says, if you wanna stick just to this book, that might be better for a beginning DM. It gives you some very basic instructions about setting out to create a map for your world and setting your PCs in a base of operations and giving some ideas about what that could be and then building out from there as to what is around the area and it gives you some suggestions for placement of a river or a mine or something like that. As we go here in the example it is walking you through more detail about the setting and what features could be in the setting and how you could provide a a beginning point for an adventure and some ideas about 
how your PCs could interact with it. And this is very useful to play out for the soloist. You could take this and approximate it to a session that you want to have and a beginning of a session that you want to have. And the discussion here of adventure and how to design an adventure, also very useful for somebody starting out with solo RPG because it gives the main points about what kinds of things need to be in an adventure, a hook, a plot, and some points along the way for marking progress, for example. So you can see it's a pretty, it's a pretty extensive uh, discussion here for the GM and the solo GM on how to create a journey for your characters and how to have narrative advancement and hooks throughout the story. And then we get to the, the monster section here, and you can see that it says, deliberately, not much material about the descriptions of monsters is provided. The DM and players are encouraged to use their imaginations to fill the gap. So you have enough that's given here with a few sentences of what it is, and you there's not a lot of illustrations here, but as such, there are a lot of monsters because there's many on a page. And you can go through, if you wanted to totally randomize this, you could number it. It's not a numbered list. I haven't counted up how many there are, but you could count them up and assign numbers to them. You could make categories of monsters based on their armor class so that you would be encountering, you wouldn't be encountering, for example, a dragon right away. You could, if you were doing some type of dungeon crawl or hex crawl that uh, you could be encountering things that more or less approximated a lower level monster. But there's quite a few pages of them and familiar gelatinous cube. There are elves who are enemies here, different types of elves. Ghouls, there's a storm giant. We saw some elementals earlier, a great Ooze, there's gnomes who are elves as uh, enemies as well. So there's a really, a really extensive uh, list of monsters here. And if that's not enough, there's a note here that could be useful as well to the soloist if you're trying to create something that's a little bit more out of the standard fantasy box. It says that you can give a surprise monster. You can roll on this table to give some ability for your monster and create a monster on the fly, as it were, uh, to be outside of the listing of monsters here. So that's a, that's a useful little instruction if you want to go off of the grid. But as you can see, there's just a ton of monsters in this book. And for the soloist, that is super useful. And then further description here about what you can do, adding wings, breath weapons, extra hit die, etc., don't try to create monsters according to this, any sort of power formula. Create them on how they feel and how they play at the gaming table. So one exercise you could do for yourself when you're starting out to create your adventure thematically would be to create the boss monster, say, that if that was part of your story that a boss monster had to be killed or vanquished, to try to imagine what would that boss monster be in my story and either take aspects of the many monsters that are in here and put them together or to create something entirely new for yourself. And finally, the, what this book really offers is a ton of different types of magic items. You have potions and scrolls and weapons and just random items that are minor and major, the lesser wands, the unusual armor, greater rings, so many things. There, it's, These tables are all numbered. And you could probably create for yourself a master list of which table you even rolled on when you encountered an enemy to say whether you were that enemy was going to give up a, or that room was going to give up a lesser wand or a magical weapon or just some miscellaneous item. And then following that are the descriptions of what all of these things do. And this is very efficiently put together and there's just so much here. There's, there's, a, there's quite a lot of offerings on the random treasures that you could encounter.
So that is a, a quick look inside 3D6 in order. It doesn't reinvent any wheel, but it does offer a ton of monsters and a ton of treasures in a really slim package with pretty familiar mechanics if you've played any type of um, AD&D or D&D based RPG. So the second single volume rule set we're going to look at is White Box, Fantastic Medieval Adventure Game. This is also based on Swords and Wizardry, and here we can take a look at the credits to the game. This is a book where the there's a little bit more of a lift in terms of working through rules and resolving combat, but we'll take a look here at the, the basic, the game itself has various familiar attributes, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. We are working with modifiers here for those attributes, as well as various experience bon bonuses that you get based on the character type that you are or the prime attribute of your character. It also has alignment, and we look at a uh, quick look through the classes here. There's a cleric, a fighter, a magic user, a thief, and the races available are dwarves, elves, and halflings. Then we have the equipment section, which we'll just skim over pretty pretty quickly before we get to the playing the game section here that talks about encumbrance rules, movement rate, encumbrance infecting movement rate, as well as the need for torches and outdoor uh, movement. Some Rules for the soloists that are useful are, for example, this listening at doors that tells you humans have a 1 in 6 chance of hearing noise, non-humans hear noise on a roll of 1 in 2 and 6, so you could build that in easily to your own system here. Detection of secret doors, triggering of traps, and uh, all this, these rules are useful for the soloist. The combat sequence is then listed here, and this is the part that is pretty significantly uh, important to this rule set, which is that there are the, there's a two hit uh, number, that's a target number that you need to roll in order to hit a certain enemy of a certain armor class. And you thus need to look up on the table after you do your roll to know whether the roll that you have done is successful to hit roll. So there is, it is involved with looking up tables to determine fighting, and some people may or may not like that as something built into the system, but it is indeed there. There's a saving throw matrix here, and it gives you different categories for saves. So you have a save against death poison, wand rays, paralyzed stone, dragon breath, spells and staves, and a single saving throw for the various types of characters, magic users, thieves, fighters, and clerics. So again, you would be looking up, referencing these tables to determine whether your saving throw was successful. Clerics and magic users are the only classes that can cast spells in this world, and we have separate lists for what they can cast, and we have in this one book up to level six for both of them. And then we have a big section of the spell descriptions. And there is a little bit of a section for GMs here. Not a ton of stuff about designing the adventure, but there is a little bit here talking about what might be needed to create a campaign, what is used for experience in terms of leveling up and some suggestions about how to conduct underworld and wilderness types of adventures, when to roll for wandering monsters, a reaction table, a uh, idea of whether or not you would be lost in the wilderness, and different movement rates for 
different types of terrain, water, and air. So this could be useful and helpful if you want to take your characters out into the world. There are some tables as well for encounter levels and suggestions of what you might encounter for various levels. And so level one listing here, two and three based on a D12 roll. So this is also helpful as solo material even goes up to level 10. And it also gives you tables for encounters by terrain type. So if you are in the open air versus on a coastal river or in the hills, you could roll on these tables and get suggestions of what you might encounter. And again, very helpful for soloists. And then we get into the uh, listing of all of the monsters and they're again also their target armor class or ascending armor class hit point table here that you will need to refer to during combat and then the alphabetical listing of the monsters with some pretty basic descriptions here of what the stats would be and then a narrative about the monster and there are quite a lot of them in this book. For treasure we also have pretty significant amount of treasure listed similar to the other book that we saw in terms of types, potions, there are there's a, a listed D100 table here for magic potions and a description of what the potions would do. Ditto for scrolls and for armor. Actually, all the magic uh, weapons and armor are a number table, so they're already random tables there for you, as well as some miscellaneous magic items at the end, lesser rings, greater wands, medium magical items and then we fill it out or we fill out the the book with this listing and description of what all of these various magical items do so there's quite a lot of treasure here for the asking there's also a deck of many things here which is an ordinary seeming deck of hand painted cards familiar perhaps from dungeons and dragons but it is nice that it lists out what the the face value of the cards are and you could use this somehow in a solo session to with a deck of cards to make a pile there and randomly choose something and then have that effect and take the risk of whether it is going to be something good or bad and then the book ends with a list of cursed items that you could possibly encounter and a lot of this treasure material would be very easy to put together and create your own type of random table that you could roll on when you say for example vanquished a foe and looted the body for something. So that is the white box and it is described as to unleash your imagination to dream of other worlds where you role play heroic characters and go on adventures just like in days of old. And the final book we're going to take a look at is Eyes Beyond the Torchlight, a fantasy adventure game by Workhorse RPG Studio. This was something I picked up totally on a whim. I can't really remember where I got it. It is the Target 12 game system. And basically the core mechanic here, and we'll look at the, the writing credit here, Scott Myers. The core mechanic here is that you are rolling a d20, adding or subtracting some modifiers, and you need to meet the number 12 in or higher in order to have a success. And that is a mechanic that works through the game and through all things you do in the game, through combat and through exploration, etc. And having such a simple die mechanic is very easy, I think, for the soloist. You can have a modification of an easier roll with a plus 1d6 or a harder roll with a minus 1d6 and in the game also something called the threat number and this is where this is the only thing about this game that bothers me which is there's the target number tn and then there's the threat number tn but they're different things they mean different things and so for example Monsters in the game have a threat number that's TN. 
this number is subtracted from the roll that you are making to try to beat a 12. So the harder the monster, the larger the TN is going to be. So this black dragon has a threat number of 7, while, as, while this little Darrow has a threat number of 1. And the stats of the game are also divided up into the three core stats of mind, body, and soul, and then three combat stats of fighting, shooting, and dodge. And mind and soul are also what are used for magic casting, depending on what type of character you play. And so again, throughout, you can just see on the pages the, the reminder that the target is 12, the target is 12 comes through, and that is very easy to keep in your mind and for solo play is useful. Additionally, the, the difficulty level here is this is the TN, the threat number. So the GM is going to calculate for basic tasks the what the threat number is going to be. And again, this will be subtracted from your ultimate role. So if something is hard, you're going to do your role with your D20 and whatever stat benefit you have, but then you're going to have a 4 subtracted from it, still trying to meet that number of 12. If something is super simple, you're subtracting a negative 4, which is adding a 4, and you would have almost an automatic success on that. Having this chart here is helpful because narratively you can just apply in conceptually, I'm trying to break into this castle right now, you know, that's very difficult to do, so I'm going to have to subtract eight from my role, or I'm in the castle and I'm walking through, I'm trying to sneak by something that's far away, that's going to be normal or a simple task. And this will help you determine what a uh, success or failure will be as you move through your story. There's also the concept of easy and hard, which is essentially like rolling with advantage or disadvantage. You get additional die to help you or to hinder you. The stats themselves are represented by different dice. So you can place a d4, d6, and d8 however you want in mind, body, and soul, or you can use three d6s in all three and the same thing is for your combat stats and so those are the 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 way you allocate the stats and then there are some derived stats like hp and initiative from your basic stats and there's a lot of different ancestries listed here with some benefits that they each has benefits so you could play dwarves elves there's a gnome ancestry which i always love halfling a half elf a half orc and a human and then there's a bunch of archetypes and the archetypes are cleric mage rogue and warrior and as you would expect they're each giving you sort of benefits and limitations for what you can do. There's also a D50 chart for hindrances. So if you opt to get a second edge or a second benefit from your archetype, you then have to take a hindrance and it explains to you what the, the detriments of those hindrances are. There are, in addition to all of this, there are backgrounds, and the backgrounds will make a role easy if it comes into play, but you can't use the background for combat. So this is essentially like a narrative or a, an explicitly story-driven benefit to your character. So perhaps you are a craftsman and you can train in you're trained in a craft that you choose and you can make some money by making things related to that. That could come in as a story and you could see here this is not a randomized list. If you wanted to number it of course you could roll randomly on it but there are things like a fisherman or a scholar or a pirate or a poet. So a little bit of three-dimensionality built in to the rules so that you have a something that will add to your travels through the world that is non-combat actions. And we have gear and weapons, as you might expect. Into the magic, you could be a mage or a cleric, and there are 
your spells listed out here. Pretty standard fare in terms of the different kinds of spells that you have as options. And this is that list of edges or benefits that we talked about earlier. And you can see there are quite a few of them here. You could also add on to your characters. You could do a house rule and give yourself even more if you wanted to flesh out your character. And what's nice about this is that there's such a range of them. So they're not all to do with combat. So for example, there is a, a brawling role where you are fighting unarmed, you make your role easy, you get basically advantage in that. But there's also something that is artistic. Roles become easy when appraising or creating art. So there is a nice uh, flowing through this rule set, there is a nice development of things that are non-combat as well as combat. And then the list of hindrances that could be part of your character as well. So you might be clumsy and need to make the role hard or a disadvantage when attempting an action that involves balance, for example. There are encumbrance rules here. They, you can carry a number of items up to 10 plus your maximum body stat dice. So the way the stats are, they're different dice. So if let's say your body stat was a D8, you would be able to carry 10 plus eight. And if you're encumbered, you're gonna be moving at half your normal rate. So again, this is something as I've talked about in other videos, Sometimes I follow encumbrance rules, sometimes I don't, but usually when I do follow them, it's to have a maximum carry amount. I don't really go into movement rates so much in my games, but that is here for you if you want it. The spell casting works essentially the same way. You're casting versus a uh, target number, and the target number may be 12, or the target number may be the individual. Some spells are cast versus trying to meet that number of 12, and then some of them have to do specifically with the enemy or the NPC against which you're trying to cast them, and that's when you would be referring to their own, um, their own threat number. There's a limited number of gems and works of art and jewelry here. There's not a ton of random tables for treasure and such in the game. There are some potions and scrolls and rings, and this is not, if you wanted to randomize this, you would have to create the number it yourself because it's not randomized. Lots of magic items here, including a flying carpet. I always love to see that in a game. And there is a treasure table here that is a D100 table that you could roll on to uh, get something and it says it's recommended you make your own tables for individual dungeons, lairs, and the like. But there is a D100 table here. And then we get into the monsters and NPCs and there's a fairly big section here of monsters and NPCs of a variety of uh, threats and sizes and difficulties. And they are alphabetically listed with traits and their basic, the actions that they can take, the damage, the movement, the size, and the HP, of course, as well as that TN number that's going to be representing the amount of challenge that it has to you. And it just covers a range of things that you would find, like basic bears, but berserkers and black pudding. There's just a blink dog. So some of these will be familiar to you if you're familiar with the kind of standard fantasy role-playing games that we know. And there are, as I said, a lot of them, they're not numbered. They are not, they're just all mixed together because they're alphabetical. So you would need to work with this table if you wanted to create something that was thematic to an external environment or a dungeon or a city. But the fact that you have so many different kinds of them is useful. There are a whole bunch of dragons as well. And you can see it's a pretty extensive group and also containing other like NPC types or character types like a, an elf drow that could be um, in your world as an enemy. Gargoyles, gelatinous cubes, Pretty standard fantasy fair, but quite a lot of them. There's This may have the most of all 
the books that I've shown you here, the largest group of enemies. The GM section, there is a GM section here at the end, and it, it's pretty short. It focuses mostly on creating NPCs, and there is a there is also a discussion of, well, how to increase levels and advance your characters, and how to take monsters or create your own monsters and give them traits and such. That's really the extent of the the GM advice in the game. And then the book closes with uh, an adventure. It's, again, not a solo adventure, but it is an adventure you could modify and play through yourself. It has some pre-made characters and some maps and some other enemies, and it's pretty lengthy at the back of the book. And that is, that's what you get. This book, I think, from the perspective of the the mechanics being very simple with the, the Target 12 system, and that being just the through line for everything you do, whether it's climbing a wall or fighting a monster or casting a spell, is really useful because it's not very hard to remember how that works. The GM advice section doesn't really give you very much, and there is nothing in here really about setting or environment or where you are or even what you're doing or how to make a mission or an adventure or a story. So that is something you would have to bring to the system. But in terms of the mechanics and the inclusion of so many enemies, if you brought an external structure to it, you could very easily make a world that had things to encounter and fight. There's not a ton in terms of treasure and things to find, so that's something else that would need to be added on. But mechanically speaking, for making characters that have attributes, plus and minus attributes, and things that can connect them to the world, these non-combat background things, I think this offers a very easy way into doing that for the soloist.